May we have a huge round of applause for our honorable chief guest, Mr. George Brooks, a saxophonist and composer, Ms. Rujuta Soman, a Kathak artist, Honorable Mrs. Jyoti Dhakne Ma'am, Executive Director of MIT Group of Institutions, Honorable Mr. Adinath Mangeshkar Sir, Secretary General, Vishwashanti Sangeet Kala Academy, Honorable Professor Dr. Milind Dobe Sir, the Principal of Vishwashanti Sangeet Kala Academy, and Honorable Mr. Menin Sir, the Campus Director. May we have a huge round of applause once again? Thank you, everyone. What is fusion? If you ask a scientist, he will say fusion is the process that powers the sun and the stars. Without fusion, there would be no life on the earth. When we see as light and what we feel as warmth is the result of a fusion reaction in the, in the core of our sun. If you ask a dancer, he will say fusion music tends to be more synthetic or electronic in nature and provides the opportunity for many different dance styles to be used during any set or even during a single song. If you ask a musician, he will say musicians who share a common goal bring their diverse musical background together with their passion and knowledge of various cultures. While fusion sounds simple, the details are difficult and exacting. We have gathered here today for one such workshop where we are extremely privileged to witness the remarkable fusion of Indian classical and jazz music. Before we begin our program, we, will al we always begin our program with the rich tradition of the World Peace Prayer. So I request all of you to stand up for the World Peace Prayer, where we pray for the peace in the world. Thank you. It is a mark of our undying tradition to invoke the Almighty at the beginning of an event. Like the great philosopher Soren Grigard once said, the function of prayer is not to influence God, but rather to change the nature of one who prays. Now we will have our traditional auspicious lighting lamp ceremony as a tribute to Mother Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge. I now request all the dignitaries on the dais 
to light the lamp and perform the Saraswati Puja, symbolically inaugurating this program. May we have a huge round of applause? A ray of light is a ray of hope. Let's all leave the darkness and step towards the bright path. Mother, we pray for your blessings with all humility. Give us wisdom to make this world a better place. May all human beings live in harmony with nature and other forms of life. May the truth prevail. May the darkness of ignorance be swept away by the dawn of self-realization. May we have a huge round of applause once again. Thank you, dignitaries. It gives me an immense pleasure to introduce Honorable Mr. George Brooks. Mr. George Brooks is a pro prolific and diverse saxophonist and composer acclaimed for successfully bridging the worlds of jazz and Indian classical music. He is the founder of Indian fusion, fusion groups Summit, Bombay Jazz, the Raga Bob Trio, and Elements. Honorable Mr. Brooks began his study of jazz and continued at the New England Conservatory of Music. While attending the conservatory, Brooks was introduced to the Indian classical music and became entranced by its melodic beauty, rhythmic complexity, and deep spiritual core. After graduating, he traveled to India, where he met master vocalist Pan Pandit Pran Nath, the giant of North Indian music, who deeply influenced pioneering composers Lamont Young and Terry Riley. Honorable Mr. Brooks immersed himself in the study with Pran Nath, cooking and caring for his Guruji in the exchange of knowledge. This is the traditional Indian style of learning known as the Guru Shishya Parampara. Returning from India, Honorable Mr. Brooks settled in California and began his long association with pianist Terry Riley. For the past 30 years, they have performed throughout Europe, the US, and Asia as a duo. In 1996, Brooks recorded Last Impression, and two years later, Night Spinner for Zakir Hussain's Moment Records. Honorable Brook, Mr. Brooks is hailed as the leading voice in Indian jazz fusion. He has also performed with India's most prominent artists, including Zakir Hussain, Hari Prasad Chaurasia, Sultan Khan, Ashish Khan, Shankar Mahadevan, and L. Subramanyam. Honorable Mr. Brooks has performed at the Queen Elizabeth Hall and Barbican, London, Netherlands, France, Singapore, etc. In 2009, Brooks was nominated for a Grammarie Award as the Best Contemporary Jazz Album. Honorable Mr. Brooks has received numerous awards and grants, to name a few, 2002 Arts International Touring Grant and 2004 Arts International Study Grant. 2007, he received the American Composers Forum Global Harmony Prize to create the score for Miners of Mumbai, a contemporary Indian jazz opera. In 2013, Brooks received a Mid-Atlantic U.S. Artist International Grant to present his group Summit at jazz festivals in Kolkata and Mumbai. We are so lucky to have you amongst us. Mr. George Brooks, may I now request Honorable Prof. Mrs. So Jyoti Dhakne, ma'am, to felicitate our guest. May we have a huge round of applause? To music, we cannot forget, forget dancers. We have a Kathak artist, Ms. Rujuta Soman, ma'am, with us, and I would like to request uh, Mrs. Jyoti Dhakne, ma'am, to felicitate Ms. Rujuta. Have a huge round of applause. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Now that the formal function is over, I request the guests to take over the dais and perform for us what we have been eagerly waiting for. MIT is extremely happy to have, among, have you amongst us, sir. And therefore, I request Honorable Mrs. Jyoti Dhakne, ma'am, to present him with a citation that has been specially designed and drafted for him. May we have a huge round of applause? A citation that has been specially drafted for our guest today. Let's again have a huge round of applause. <laughs> Honorable Mrs. Jyoti Dhakne, ma'am, would like to share a few words with the audience. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, sir, I think uh, all welcome procedures are already done. But uh, on behalf of our university, I should welcome you again as a formal uh, thing. But uh, one thing, like for two hours we are together. We had our tour of our Sangeet Academy, Raj Memorial, our biggest dome. But uh, I'm really overwhelmed, sir. He knows much more about India what you people know. Uh, means, for, like, means whatever I am telling him, he knew that before only. Like few words from like all ragas and Indian classical music knowledge, what he have. Uh, whatever we start four years back, uh, but I think from today, uh, we can say this is a new beginning with Indian classical and Western music. Uh, so we are going to be like uh, new, new with uh, start with a fusion of our classical music and uh, Western music. <coughs> but his knowledge about Indian classical music is uh, really means I can I don't have any words to express it. So. Today's workshop is a main uh, function. These are all other formalities what we are doing. But this workshop is uh, going to be a new milestone for our institute. And uh, definitely those students are from music. They should attend this. But uh, those who have like architecture, fine arts students, uh, they can attend this workshop till uh, the afternoon session. And for after lunch, they can continue with their uh, other activities. But for music people, I think uh, he has some great things in his mind with your instruments and whatever you are learning. So uh, Adinaji, I think you should uh, see whatever he wants to conduct the after session in Sangeet Academy, he can. And uh, definitely this is a very precious thing for you people that uh, to start a new instrument as a hobby, yes, we can think about uh, his instrument uh, that uh, if we get a good uh, teacher for that, we can start from next year. As already we have started with guitar as a, a Western instrument, uh, other classical uh, instruments and classical Sangeet we are following up. Like, but uh, this is this is really a great thing for MIT ADT University uh, because sir, this university we are uh, totally uh, people from technology like metal and <laughs> machines. But uh, for last four years we are trying to blend this with art, music, and uh, fine arts like painting, sculpture, and other things as well. So this is a very unique combination uh, which is starting in India. Uh, with this university, we can say. Uh, there is no other university in India which is working for like technology and art both. So this is a very great pleasure for our students that you are here. And uh, we are starting with a new venture for our students. And uh, thank you very much, Adinath Ji, that uh, you gave this opportunity to these students. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to have you here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We now end here with the formal program and what we have been e eagerly waiting for. I request the guest to take over. Thank you. Especially since uh, some of you are music students, some of you are engineering students, uh, maybe I'll tell a little bit about how I came to be here at, at this time. I'm, I, think, I think my journey in music and art is, is a little bit unusual. and. Uh, Perhaps it's instructive as you go into your careers and, and lives as either performing artists or uh, 
engineers. Kind of, uh, for me, I mean, it's, it's nice to see that you've got an engineering college with art students present because the creativity that artists have to bring to their work is, is something that can be very instructive for people who are in the sciences. I mean, sciences we like to think of as being an exact thing. You've got your measurements and you know what something's going to be, but the, the you know, people like Steve Jobs, people like Bill Gates who've kind of changed the nature of, of how the world operates creativity is at the core of, of what they do and I think it's instructive if you interact with your fellow students who are coming from the artistic disciplines I think you will um, you know you'll grow as, as creative thinkers for myself I actually was planning on being in medicine that was the uh, that was the field that I had imagined for myself although I started playing the saxophone at a young age, I was 10 years old when I picked up the instrument for the first time. I didn't come from a family of musicians, so there wasn't really an anticipation that I would go into music. That was considered more of a hobby. Um, but I had an affinity for it. I liked performing. And um, when I got into college uh, as a pre-medical pre student, I also started performing pr professionally. I joined some bands. I started touring around uh, New York State and playing, playing dance music. When I decided that that was the discipline I wanted to follow seriously, I left, I left college and I attended a music conservatory. I th uh, it was mentioned early a place called the New England Conservatory of Music. It was a school in Boston. It had been there for 150 years, which is a, a long time in, in America, not so long in India. And I began studying Western classical music, traditional harmony, jazz, and just by chance took a course called a Survey of Indian Classical Music. And because I had an elective and I wanted to look at something that was different from, what, from anything I knew. And when I heard Indian classical music for the first time, I, you know, it was like the light bulb going off over my head. Something really touched my soul. It, it sparked my imagination. And although the music in many ways was very different from anything else I had heard, it also sounded extremely familiar to me. And I started trying to figure out how I could express what I was hearing on the saxophone. And I was listening to the old masters, you know, I was listening to the, like Drupad vocals, the Dagger brothers, I was listening to Ram Narayan playing Sarangi, Panalal Ghosh, Viji Jog, these, these older masters, and I was really attracted to it. I could feel this deep spiritual core, I could hear this kind of attention to the sur, to the notes that, that I didn't hear in Western music. And there was a quality of expression that, that, that I was looking for. Now, as a student at a conservatory, trying to play Indian, or looking even at it playing Indian music on the saxophone, that was not something that my teachers liked. You know, and I think you'll find this, if you go in some direction that's maybe more individualistic, you might find some resistance from your teachers and maybe from your parents and maybe from your peers but if you if you stay true to what what your imagination is telling you if you follow the path that something inside you is telling you to do it will probably lead you in a good direction so circumstances happened that when I graduated from this conservatory, which was in Boston on the eastern part of the United States, I followed my heart, shall we say, to California. Um, and, and Northern California, the San Francisco area, is, uh, has been a center for Indian classical music in the United States. Ali Akbar Khan, the great Sarod Maestro, had established a school there in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s. So many of the great um, Indian classical artists, either while they were traveling or while they established bases in the U.S., did it in um, Northern California. So Zakir Hussain was in that area. 
Krishna, sitarist Krishna Bhatt, um, Swapan Chowdhury, a great tabla maestro, was there. And when I arrived there, I, I was able to interact with these musicians and get much more information than I could at school. I started sitting, especially with Krishna Bhatt, um, a sitarist from Jaipur who was living in this, actually within walking distance of my home. So we started playing and um, my, my wife, who was then my girlfriend, was, was there in California attending a college at which Pandit Pranath, who was a great vocalist from the Karanagarana, was teaching. And my wife got a fellowship to come study in India. She was also a music student. And I came with her. What, why, what in particular are you applauding? An artist. No, no, no. In fact, she brought me to India the first time. But I think, and we met, I'll tell you, honestly, we met while I was a student in Boston. We were quite young. And um, she, I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, for, for no particular reason, she was a, I would say she was a spiritual seeker and f became acquainted with the teachings of Hazrat Nayat Khan, Sufi Nayat Khan, who introduced Sufism to the West. And while I was a student in Boston, she was a student of Pir Velayat Anayat Khan, the son of Hazrat Anayat Khan. She came to Boston to perform in something called the Cosmic Celebration and wound up, I was living in a large house with lots of students and one of the, st one of the people in that home was, was her friend from high school and she came and we met while we were all living in this big house full of students. She then wandered off in a Volkswagen <laughs> that stopped driving in San Francisco. So that's where she wound up and started going to school and learned that Terry Riley, who uh, was mentioned, was teaching there, a fantastic composer and pianist, and Pandit Pranath. And Terry Riley, who had already become very famous uh, as an innovator in a school of classical music, contemporary music known as minimalism, so he had already become very well known, but when he met Pranathji, he became entranced with, with Indian music. And he's a very good exponent of singing Khayal music, very dedicated, hardworking musician. So me, Terry Riley, well, so I came to, I came to Delhi, and I was immersed in the Guru Shisha Parampara. I, as they mentioned, I have a few talents. I can play a little saxophone, I can cook, and I'm a good masseuse. And when you've got that, your guru is pretty happy. So he, uh, I, and, and I had been a pre-med student, and so Pranathji had had a heart attack um, maybe a year before I met him. So he liked the fact that I had a little bit of pre-medical training and I could be near him. He liked the fact that I could cook him food without salt, which nobody in India would do. <laughs> and, and I could massage him. Which, which, which he liked. So, so we became actually very close very quickly and uh, traveled to India. We went to Shirdi together. We went to uh, Nepal. Shirdi where Sai Baba. So, yeah. I, <laughs> I, well, I, like I said, I, you know, maybe a past life was awakening. I, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to know, but um, so I lived for 10 months very close with Guruji. I went back to the U.S. where, where I met Krishna Bhatt, the sitarist, and myself and Terry Riley and Krishna used to perform together. So from very early on, I was trying to understand my relationship to Indian classical music. And at the same time, I was trying to understand who I was as a young artist. As I said, I didn't grow up in a particular tradition, so I wasn't emulating my father or my mother. And, uh, you know, I'd been exposed to jazz, I'd been exposed to the Beatles, but I was looking to see what kind of statement I could make as an artist. And uh, I would say rather late compared to many musicians when I was 40. I mean, I was already touring with important musicians, but it wasn't until I was 40 and ha having m my third child that I felt... Um, confident as a composer, that I felt like I had really brought 
a couple of things together from my experience playing jazz, playing blues, and my experience playing Indian classical music, or should I say playing with classical Indian artists. So I made my first recording with Krishna Bhatt and Zakir Hussain. And as she mentioned, Zakir Hussain had a, has a record label called Moment Records. They released the first recording, and a couple of years later, um, the second recording. And I started touring around the U.S. with Zakir had a group at the time called the Rhythm Experience. And so we started touring in the U.S. and Canada. And obviously, working with a musician of Zakir's stature, I became known to a lot of other musicians in India. And the, the second recording brought in Ashish Khan Saab and Sultan Khan Saab. The next one had Niladri Kumar. Then I met Kala Ramnath. So, so many, many doors were open to me. And I think because my heart, you know, my love of this music was very genuine. My love of the culture and appreciation for the culture was, um, was very real and, and continues to be. Um, you know, the, the doors kept opening and kept walking through them. And so since 2001, I've been coming to India as a performing artist living here. I came to Pune in 2004 and spent a couple of weeks working with Shama Bhatte, the um, Kathak, Kathak dancer. That was one of the awards that was mentioned. I was given a grant to come and work with her, her developing kind of a looking for relationships between Kathak and jazz. And uh, just recently, I met Rujuta Soman, who um, I've known now for two days. <laughs> but, but we've put together a little program um, based on one of the uh, compositions that I've written. So, so what, what I should say is that, you know, the big difference between jazz or Western classical music and Indian music is this idea of harmony versus not harmony or versus modality. An Indian classical performance can go, let's say, for an hour and a half using five notes. And most Western musicians would find that difficult or stifling, whereas I, would, I for some reason, found that very liberating. I found, felt very comfortable improvising within one set of notes for a long period of time. That's, that, for many Western musicians, it doesn't spark their imagination. They feel restricted by it. But I feel very comfortable in that, and I feel um, looking for those, you know, what's the power of each note? What does each note say? What's, what's really the relationship between sa and re, between pa and sa? What does it mean when ma, ga, what, you know, you feel the incredible gravity and pull between, between those notes. And we have it in Western music, but it's, it's different. It's not, it's not quite the same. So one of the things um, I think any musician does to learn music is imitation. That's kind of our, our first thing. And because we live in the modern age, we, we, get, we don't have to sit with a guru always. We can listen to a recording. We can say, wow, how does Bismillah Khan play Marwa? And we can type into YouTube Bismillah Khan Marwa, and it will, it will pop up. So what, 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 what we jazz musicians, what we musicians do, we call transcribe, which means, I mean, since we write music, I'll sit down and listen to a solo of my favorite saxophone player and take certain phrases, I'll write them down and study them. I'll do the same thing with Hari Prasad Chirasia or Bari Golam Ali Khan. I'll, you know, I will look to say, what is it that inspires me about that moment? And, uh, and I'll study that. And maybe I'm going to take out my instrument now. Does anybody want to ask any questions first? So while I'm putting this instrument together, I might as well explain what I'm doing. This is, this is a tenor saxophone, and the saxophone has a whole family. Tenor, to me, I started on alto, which is the type that you have in the, uh, in the academy. Uh, it's a pr 
the alto is a pretty common instrument for students to start on because it's smaller, and children are smaller, generally. And um, the tenor, I mean, I started on alto, I switched to tenor, partially because there were certain musicians, you know, uh, who had played this instrument, and they kind of inspired me. And partially because it, it sounds a little bit more like it's the range of my own voice. I also have, a, I have another saxophone here called a soprano, which is quite a high pitch, more like a flute, which is interesting and has a great sound and it's very penetrating and clear, but it always feels like it's, I'm playing slightly in somebody else's voice. This feels, I'm, I'm myself kind of a baritone. So the way the, so the way the sound is produced in the saxophone is actually through this little mouthpiece and this tiny piece of cane, actually, which doesn't last very long and is always difficult. So this is kind of the bane of every saxophone player's existence is finding a good read and then hoping it lasts <laughs> and hoping one is there when you have an important performance and usually that doesn't all line up. <laughs> so what's interesting is this, is this mouthpiece and this read if you play it without the saxophone, it doesn't sound very nice. But if you put it on the saxophone, it sounds pretty good. Some of you must be music students. You must be music students, the way you're listening and nodding. Okay, so if I play that, do you hear something? Does it sound, does it remind you of something? What does that make you think of? Just, and there are no wrong answers. The ornamentation, okay. Is, does, it, does it remind you of any raga, of any, what, and what is that? Okay, interesting. It could be Bhupali, especially if I played it from here. Okay. So what, so what so what we do in the West that's so different from what happens in India is that we have to we have to learn to play Bhupali or anything from each of the 12 shrutis. So if I would play what we call a chromatic, so if I play a major scale, right, like Bilabo. And Bupali is just five of those notes. Or one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, five, six, one. We use numbers a lot. In, uh, in our Western, you know, in talking to other musicians. And I'll kind of explain why. Okay, so if I take a raga like Bupali, I have to learn to play it. Oh, so I played the major scale. This is a chromatic scale. That's every shruti. It's sa. Komal re, shudare, komal ga, shudaga, ma, tivrama, pa, komal da, ta, komal ni, shudni, sa. Okay? You hear that a lot when people are laughing in the movies. <laughs> okay? That's the chromatic scale. That's every shruti. But we have to play every scale. We have to be comfortable playing every scale 
starting on every shruti. So if we go. So we, we, we have to be able to do that easily and in different patterns. In that case, I was just going up every shruti. But we should be able to play other ones where we're going. So, so that's, that's kind of, that's, that's one of our, our tasks as Western musicians that's so different from, um, from, from Indian classical music. And, and what I was saying about using numbers, if I, if I start on, on one particular note, I can tell somebody, OK, I'm going to play a pentatonic scale, which is what we call Bupali, pentatonic, meaning five notes. I'm going to play that on a one chord. Then I'm going to go to a four chord. And they'll know right away, oh, if he's starting on C, the four chord is F. So I'll do like. And if, and if we were doing a, never mind, electronics. So we'll get to that in a minute. But, and that's how we create song structures. That's we, how we create harmonic structure. We say, OK, it goes from the one to the four to the five to the one. Okay, that's that's a simple harmonic structure as outlined by the individual notes. If I'm playing it on I, I don't need that. I don't need I don't need a synthesizer. So um all right, so here I am, a musician living in a harmonic world and also living in a, you know, what we call Indian classical music, we call a modal music, meaning it's not, it's not interested in what's happening in a um, vertical sense, but it's happening more in a horizontal sense. So notes aren't happening on top of each other. We're not playing chords. We're playing one note at a time and over a rhythmic cycle, over a tala. So how can I, I mean, my challenge was how could I bring those things together? And, um, well, maybe I will use this a little. Let's under it to and that's i mean for us that's you know that's a big deal suddenly Bhupali becomes some sort of coffee sounding thing, right? I, I, I don't know the name of the raga, the minor pentatonic. <laughs> right? 
but it comes, you know, out of the coffee cup. We do a lot of, well, a lot of that. I mean, I, I recently wrote a piece, or I'm kind of writing a piece. I mean, if you take what we call motifs or phrases, okay, so same three notes I'm just playing. Engineering students will go, he's playing four different notes, it's not three. Okay, so I uh, take the same four notes, <laughs> play them over and over again, but if you change what's happening, that's, that's, how, we, that's how we change the colors of what we do. So I've made a lot of, a, a great deal of movement, something that would probably sound good to an Indian classical musician. They could hear it and understand that I'm doing something, but it would be very elusive. It'd be very hard to find, you know, in, if you're relating it just to sob. So, so that's, you know, that's kind of what we've done in the West, and that's what I've looked to do in my life as an artist, is find ways to take my love of these two very different systems which to me aren't that dis different just because I kind of see both of them and bring them together in what, what I like to imagine as kind of a personal form of expression. And, um, and I like working with Indian artists, so I have to write music that will make sense to them. You know, I don't, I don't want to say, okay, just play whatever you want over something that doesn't make sense to you. I want to. I want to write a piece of music that, that. That that makes that makes sense. That makes them feel both comfortable as an improviser, but also challenged, so that they, want to push themselves to be, creative, to be inspired. I think that, most, serious musicians, most mature musicians, they want to be challenged and they want to be inspired. You know, you don't want something that's like kind of yeah, I could do that in my sleep. You want to be sitting a little bit on the edge of your seat, saying, okay, this is going to push me to ex find some new territory. So that's, you know, and that's why I like playing, you know, I, I just did a concert two days ago with uh, Hari Prasad Chirasia, and that's absurd in many ways for me to be sitting on stage with a master like that, because it's, it's like being in class in public. <laughs> because, you know, this, this is somebody who's, who's kind of changed the way the flute is played, you know, one of the really important musicians of the last century in India. And, you know, I'm very much a baby at his feet, but I'm incredibly inspired by what he does and challenged to try to rise, you know, in front of an audience to, to, to add to the, you know, to add to what, to, to what we're expressing. So, you know, I like to be able to offer that back in some way as a composer. And with Rujutha here, who I just met, we, uh, 
we were looking for something to, to, to express. And I, I wanted something that would be interesting for her and, uh, <laughs> and interesting for me. So we, so we, we um, well, we, we, we got to sit together for a couple of hours and put together a, prog a program that we presented yesterday. And we took a fairly complicated piece, which I think maybe I'll show you piece by piece so that our tabla player, who we just met today, has never heard the music, can, um, can get a sense of what we're doing. The piece, uh, it's entitled Spice. It was recorded on um, an album of mine called Spirit and Spice. Swapin Chowdhury played tabla on it, and Kala Ramnath played violin, and Niladri Kumar played sitar. So it was a very kind of a, it was, it was a large ensemble. The piece is in a, an 11-beat cycle, and it's actually in kind of a number of different 11-beat cycles. It starts off in kind of like a charukeshi sound, and then it, then it morphs into other areas. Okay. Yeah. So the opening section, which is in a... <laughs> which is in a slow 11-beat cycle, which we're dividing three, 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 and two, um, is going to be performed with this sense of abhinaya, this sense of um, expressive dance. section kind of viewed more as 22 and engineering students how does 22 relate to 11 no, nobody answers well it's two times and it's divided <laughs> as um, 9 and 13 which we look at three and a half and five and a half so it's like one two three dock it to one two three four five dock it to one two three Four, five and a half, one, two, three, 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 four, five and a half, one
as, as an 11. Then it kind of does a 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 7, which also equals, oh guys, come on, <laughs> 22, okay? But, but although I'm explaining the math to you, the way I write the pieces is by hearing the melodies. Then I figure out what the math is. I'm not, I'm not looking to create a mathematical statement as much as a musical statement. that 
I have the tougher player stop for, um, just because you've never heard it before, is the is the kind of the ending of that fast section, and it's. <laughs>
of the tambora, which, I mean, it kind of takes the idea of a rhythmic cycle or a tala, but it kind of merges it, merges it with a tambora. So the tambora is a cycle, although it's not played in tal, it's played out of time, but it creates this kind of mandala, this atmosphere. So the patterns here are...
you want to do a little bit of the Rupak tal? Or? Oh, well, actually, one thing that I was going to ask you, because I don't remember, D during the, uh, this section. <laughs> Six five five six, but we decided you were going to do something to a different subdivision. Oh, we were going to do little eights, little uh, yeah, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it up, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it, right? You hear four, three, four, three, four, four, right? Every four, four, and three is eleven. Tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it in me. That's a simple way to do it. Mirror image. Tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it in. Tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it to tuck it. Tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it in me, tuck it to tuck it to tuck it in me, tuck it in me. Let's hear you loud. One, two, three, four. No, over no, no, so, this is the level of math that I understand. Simple addition, subdivisions, no variables. If there's, if you give me an X or a Y, I'm lost. But if I, can, but I know how to add up to at least maybe even 16. But it's, but it really creates these nice polyrhythms. Right. So, and then you can start moving those little blocks around. If you got, if you got taka dimi taka dimi taka that could become. Right? So you move those things around and it creates, and then if you add a melodic idea to Thank mm -hmm. you. 
my recipe for Murga Methi. Thank you. 
that was, of course, in Wattal. Wattal music students. Go ahead, shout it out. Rupak, Rupak Tal, okay? Seven beat cycle. I didn't have to explain that one to him. It's, although it's a composition of mine, it fits really comfortably into the classical um, structure. Right, right away he hears that, right away she hears that. I'm the only one struggling. <laughs> um, but then that composition that has a, a quick teen top. This is a little bit. This is a little less traditional, but I think I think. So Asheo will grab this pretty quickly, I think. Thank you. 
ideas came from his guru, as well as from his guru by Vijay Gatte, who was an old friend of mine who I worked with for many years. The thing that I was talking about at the end of the class when I was showing some of these rhythmic ideas is what we like to call both, I think, no, turn that down, too much, uh, is uh, what we call subdivisions. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Yes? So if we're counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we can also count that as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, six, seven, eight. But then we have what are called accents. Right? We can go one, two, three, four, one, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. So in Western rhythmic theory, we think downbeats and upbeats. Now, does that correlate in Indian music? Maybe not. yes? I mean, we have. We have our sum and our Kali, but I don't know if we think so much about, you know, in jazz we're like, and that's never one. That's always two, four, two, four, one, two, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. And that's what we call swing in Western music. That gives us a, that kind of like, you're supposed to tell your ear. 
Yes. So, so that's that's kind of the lilt that gives us kind of our, our feeling of swing. You know, in in classical music, you may have. I mean, you know, South Indian they've got their adi column. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One. I don't feel that, I mean those, the open beats in that don't feel like weak beats to me. I think it helps uh, keep the structure of the tala. And then of course in teen tal, we have the kali, which is interesting, you know, and somebody here I'm sure knows better than I do, but you know, da, tin, din, da, da, din, din, da, da, tin, din, da. And although the ninth beat is the Kali, you often hear that, to me, it's like the tuba player demonstrates it almost more sometimes on the 10th beat. You know, you kind of really, I don't, I don't know if that, does that make sense to you guys who are, mm. Even though we show Kali on nine, you hear this kind of click uh, on ten. So again, I don't know. You know, somebody I'm sure has written a PhD thesis about it, but but it, it's just it's just interesting to note that. And in Rupaktal, the last piece I played, which is a seven beat cycle, tin tin uh, tin uh, tin. Uh, Din, din, na, din, na, din. And even though some is Kali, you're still moving towards some. You still that's still going to be what in my Western mind is a downbeat. Right? Now the other thing that's interesting, I mean we have we have what are called pickups, notes that begin before the downbeat. So in classical music and when I say classical here, I'm generally speaking of Indian classical. Um, you have your mukra. You know what this is? I mean, this is the phrase that brings you to some, right? And that's really a very much an Indian concept. So often your lines, your tea highs, as you become a more advanced musician, are actually heading towards the mukra rather than heading towards some. You may and a T high at the mukra, and then bring that, go get to the sum that way. It's harder for those of us who are coming from the outside. It's, it's more sophisticated, I think. It least feels that way to me. So getting back to subdivisions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay? So we're so we're going taka well, we can even slow it down. Taka taka. So I've learned a little bit about North Indian rhythm system and a little bit about the South Indian. And for for Westerners, the South Indian is in some ways a little easier to grab onto because you're not trying to say different strokes. Uh, in, uh, we just say taka, taka dimi, taka dimi. Much, much, much less uh, for our little brains to absorb. And I can count to two, I can count to three, and most of the time I can get to four as well. So taka, 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 say it with me. Taka, 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 taka. And then three. Okay, so that's it. What if we wanted to do five? What do you think we'd do? Taka taki da taka taki da taka taki. So if we go back to looking at four, taka dimmi taka dimmi. That's eight, right? 
Taka, give me taka, give me taka, give me taka. Takita, taka, takita, takita, taka, takita. Okay, so suddenly I've gone into advanced mathematics. Instead of four plus four, what am I doing? Well, two, 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 three, two, three, three, probably would equal a, right? Taka, taki, taki, taka, taki, taki, right? Two plus three is five plus three is a very kind of standard subdivision. Taki ta taka taki ta. It's another variation, right? So we can go taka taki ta taki ta, taki ta taka taki ta, and taki ta taka ta taki. Right? So three plus three plus two, three plus two plus three, and two plus three plus three. So already we have three variations, right? Out of taka give me taka give me taka give me taka. Taka, taki, taki, taka, taki, taki, taka, taki, taki, taka, taki, 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 and then move the two over again. Taki, taki, taka, taki, 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 taki. Okay? So, and if you're getting like. That's three plus three plus two. But instead of showing every beat, we're just we're getting we're getting that I call it lilt, you know, that kind of folk rhythms have that, dance rhythms have it. And then if we did the other one, so we, that was the three plus two plus three. Taki ta 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 ki ta da dum da da dum da ta 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 ki dum dum da dum dum ta ki. Say so. Say with me. Dum dum ta ki ta 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 dum ta ki ta dum. So, so good. So right, you feel how the subdivisions which come naturally to you, if you think about them, then you can see where they're from, and then you can create others. Like maybe you feel that doom, doom, takita. But what if I put the two in the front? Doom, doom, takita, 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 doom, doom. And these are just these, we're just dealing with three little pieces of rhythm, and two of them are the same. 
but they all they equal a. We've got our top two talkatives and one talka. Then if we if we go to six and we're dealing with eight beats, if we double that and go to sixteen, then we, then we've got even more mathematical possibilities. We can do seven plus nine, right? Does everybody agree seven plus nine is going to equal sixteen? Because I, I only went to like music school, so I haven't done the higher math. Okay, so da din da da din da 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 Three, so four and three. So let's just let's go over the seven part. Taka dimmi taki, the taka dimmi taki, the taka dimmi taki, taka dimmi taki, the taka dimmi taki, taka dimmi taki, the taka dimmi taki, the taka dimmi Doom, doom, taki, the doom, doom, taki, the doom. Do, do the doom, doom. So instead of saying taka, we're just going to go doom. So we're, we're going to use one note, which in the West we would call a quarter note, in the place of two notes, which in the West we would call an eighth note. So we're going doom, doom, taki, the 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 doom, doom, so that's the seven. The nine is going to be it's going to be like four plus five or six plus three, depending on how you think. But we're going to go doom 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 taki to 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 taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taki to taka oh sorry right and taka dimmi taki to taka taki to taka dimmi taki taka taki to doom doom 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 taka taki to Okay. And you notice if we're doing that because it's a nine beat pattern, but we're doing like the little eighteen in the middle of the nine, half, the second half is all on the up beat. So Taka dimmi taka 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 dimmi taka taki the taka dimmi taka taki the doom doom taka taki the din din taka taki doom doom taka taki the din din taka taki doom doom taka taki the so we take our seven din din taki ta and our nine din 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 taki ta and we put them together and we think in a. Din din taki the din 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 taki the taka din mi taka taka din mi taka taki the taka din taka taka din mi taka taki the. Now, taka din mi taka taka din mi taka taki the taka din mi taka taka din mi taka taki. Taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka taka dimmi taka taki to din din taka to din 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 taki to din din taka to din 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 taki to din din taka to din 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 taki to Taki 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 taki to da din da 
So what am I doing there? What, what, what did I switch to? I started with two, three, and I did follow with a two. Taka taki to taka taki to. That's how I began. Which is what's taka taki to? What? Okay. What is two? What is two plus three equal? Okay. So I did taka taki to, taka taki to again, and then if I'm going to be in sixteen, how many beats do I need? How many? I need six beats more. So I went taka taki to taka taki to taka taki taki or doom doom doom. Taka taki to taka taki to taka taki to. Okay, so I did two three two three three three. Okay, five five and six. And the six can also be taka taka to me. So you can get you can start getting a lot of rhythms out of the six. Taka taki to taka taki to taka taka to me. Taka taki to taka taki to taka taka to me. Taka taka. Taka taki to taka taka dimi taka taki to taka taki to taka taka dimi taka taki to 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 din din ta taka taki to taka taki to taka dimi taka taka taki to taka taki to din din ta. So we got seven plus nine. We got five, five, and six. Now. I'm sure we can move that six around as well, right? Taka taka to din din da, taka taki to taka taki to taka dimi, taka taka taki to taka to taka dimi. Where am I? Taka. I got back to my seven. Taka dimi, taka to taka dimi, taka taki to taka taki to taka taki to din din da. So I went seven nine five five six. Okay, let's try that. Let's just. Let's see if we can put those two together. So it's going to be taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to. Let's review that. Two, three, four. Taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka to. Now let's look at the two fives and the six. Taka taki to. Taka taki to taka dimi taka taka taki to taka taki to taka dimi taka taka taki to taka taki to taka dimi taka taka taki to taka taki to taka taka dimi. Or let's go for the six. Let's just go din din da. Make it a little bit easier. Okay. Taka taki to taka taki to din din da. Taka taki to taka taki to din din. Taka taki to taka taki din din da. Taka taki to taka taki to din din da. Okay, so let's now do do the seven. Taka dimmi taka to taka taka taki to taka dimmi taka taka taka. Taki to taka dimmi taka to taka taki to taka taki to taka taki to din din da. So we're going to do three times the seven plus nine and the last one five five and six. So it gives us this feeling that we're that we're completing a cycle. Okay, one two one two three four. Taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka taki to taka taki to din din da taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka Taka dimmi taka taki to taka taki taka taki to din din da. Taka dimmi taka taka dimmi taka taki to taka dimmi taka to taka dimmi taka taki 
Taka dimi taki ta 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 dimi taki taki ta 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 taki taki ta ta din din ta. Right? And you could, you know, taki dimi taki ta din din ta taki taki din taki ta din din ta taki taki din taki ta din din ta taki ta din taki ta din taki ta taki ta din taki ta taki din taki ta din taki ta taki ta taki ta taki din taki ta taki ta taki din din ta taki ta taki din 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 ta ta ki ta din ta ta din ta ta ki ta ta ki din mi ta. So, just by using a few little bits of addition, little numbers, twos and threes, and putting them together, you can create a lot of a lot of rhythmic variations. And you know we're doing it very consciously, counting, and that's. Very much the best way to start, but um, then when you start flowing, you, you're going to be feeling, especially in a rhythm like four, which we're all pretty comfortable with. We most of us walk, you know, in a binary fashion, one foot after the next. So we feel we feel that one two thing a lot. Most of the pop music we listen to, doom 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 doom. So we're used to that. So if we start playing with the subdivisions, we're still going to be pretty comfortable that we're going to remember where one is, or we're going to feel where one is. So we can we can play around with those subdivisions. Um, now I could show you how I practice some of those ideas in a in a melodic sense as well. Some 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 things. So so let me, let me get my horn out. I assume most of you who are, who are dealing with melodic instruments practice scales. Yes? Do you practice kind of just a... Right? Sorry, I got my button. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm moving, in this case, we're moving a, a C minor pentatonic and a C sharp minor pentatonic. So that's, that's one way to move through the keys. But in Western music, we have what's called a circle of fifths or a circle of fourths, meaning we go from sa to ma, that becomes sa, we go to the next ma, that becomes sa, we go to the next ma. And that's how our key signatures change. And if this works, I mean, if this C, C major is all natural notes. It's a, it's like a, it's a, oh, I'm just hearing like, what's okay. So there's C major, has no sharps or flats. F major has one flat. B flat major has two flats. Um, a flat major, three flats. D flat major, four flats. And it goes around in one direction, you add more flat notes. You go around in the other direction, you add sharps. So C major, again, no sharps or flats. G major, one sharp. D major, two sharps. A major, three sharps, E major. So as we travel around this circle, in, in harmony, the chord that is, the, let's say, in, in the, the, the pa chord always leads to the sa chord. So in, in, the, in the key of C, C, D, E, F, G, a G chord leads to, to C. Uh, so all these chords of fourth away are what we call the, the dominant chords that go to the tonic chords, the one chord. So we like to travel around this key as a, uh, this keys, this cycle of keys or circle of fourths, um, and fourths and fifths are just opposites. C to G is a fifth, and G to C is a fourth. I know this is getting a little, uh, a little esoteric, but when you play, what is that? Sa ga pa ga sa. That's what we call a major chord, a major triad. If I do, if I then go to ma, I do the same thing. So I go. It has a logic, I think, to your ear. Or, I mean, I don't want to tell you that. Does it have, does it make some kind of musical sense to you? Do you, do you hear that a little bit? seven of the next key. So it's what we call a leading tone. Thank you. 
having it more closer to your normal vocal range makes it easy because you all nailed that. statement, even though it travels about as far away from the starting place as it can. I mean...
just learned everything there is to know about Western harmony. The cycle, I mean, this, that cycle of fifths or cycle of fourths, that, that is really the foundation for, um, for, for sort of the harmonic underpinnings of, of Western music. It's how a lot, you know, all, almost all rock and roll songs, folk songs, alternative songs deal with, with kind of three chords, a one chord, because remember I said we, we use numbers to denote scale position. So kind of a sa chord, a ma chord, a four chord, and a five chord, and a one chord. How many roads, you know that song? How many roads must a man make it walk down before they call him a man? The So you you know that song, yes? So so a million folk songs have been written. Have, yeah, hold on. <laughs> um, so a million folk songs have been written with those three chords, and millions and millions of dollars have been made using just those very basic chords. The one chord. The four chord, the five chord, and the one chord. The other one that's very popular is a six chord, which is, and this is all without alteration from the major scale. So if you play from C, a C, a, a one, three, and five from C, you get a C major. If you play one, three, and five from A, you get an A minor. If you play from one, three, five from four, from F, you get an F major. And if you play a 1 3 5 from G, which is the 5, you get a G major. And from those chords, you get a. So we get a C major chord, but instead of going to A minor, we may raise the third. And so we go. find the quality of the chords for us tend to be the third and the seventh, okay? The root and the fifth, the one and the five, they, at least for right at this moment, they don't really change, okay? So you get the root and the fifth. You can't tell if it's major or minor if you have the root and the fifth. If you add the third, you say, then you know it's major. If you add a flat, if you add a flat third, know it's minor. If you but you can have a minor, a major chord with a major seven. That gives you like the rod hot rod hops and wine. So that's a major seventh chord. Very sweet, very sweet kind of sound. But if you if you lower the seventh but keep the third major, that's what's called the dominant chord. Us as 
we learned to the four chord. And then we could do a four minor. But a minor with a major seventh. Okay, so we went, here's F, F major. Here's F minor triad. Here's F minor triad with a major seventh. Which is kind of a, it's got a little more uh, angularity to it. And that is, uh, the, you know, that's the sound of rap pat beat. Which in 
like the early days of Western harmony, that was considered the devil's interval. That was like not allowed in the churches in, in Europe. And it's the jazz musician's favorite interval, so it just shows where we're at. But that is also the classic interval that defines any dominant chord. Because the, the interval between three and flat seven is a tritone. And if we reverse that, I mean, if we come down a half step, okay, check this out. C, as I told you, moves to F. Okay, we'll just deal with that one. That's C is the fifth degree of F. So to go five, one, my right hand, I mean my left hand, goes up a fourth from C to F. And right he here I'm playing the three and the seven of C, which if I move it down a half step becomes the seven and the three of F. And I can do that all the way around that entire circle of keys that I was showing you. So it goes... studied Western music theory a little bit? I'm sorry? To, the, to this conservatory? Somewhere else. And studying, are you playing piano? Yeah. Piano is really the great encyclopedia of, of, of Western theory. It's all kind of laid out in front of you in black and white. You can, really, you can really see things. Guitars are, are much more difficult to visualize, although you can play chords on them. Saxophone, you can't visualize at all, and you can only play one note at a time. But on a piano, you can see a major chord, and you can see how the third degree of that chord is just a half step below the next key, and how they, they lead to each other. I want questions. No questions. differentiate the methodologies of music, the teaching methodologies of music used in the uh, Indian classical music that is Guru Shishya Parampara and those <coughs> used in the West, the teaching methodologies? Well, it, it depends because the West is a big place I mean, and some people, like if, if people come to me, I probably teach them a little bit more in the Guru Shisha thing or they'll, although they don't have to wash my kurtas. But, um, <laughs> I like to, you know, as a teacher, I like to look at what a student wants and I try to guide them. I don't try to tell them what to do. In, in the West, I mean, and of course there are different schools, in classical Western music, basically you are taught to read and as you progress as a reader, you know, I think of a classical pianist, 
you you progress to more and more complicated material, and emphasis is on um, reading and then memorization of, of complex material. So the the great concert pianists perform long concertos without without music paper in front of them, which is a you know a skill that I can't really imagine having. But a lot of those players, as much music as they've memorized and been able to expound, if you said, okay, just give me something, they'll be like, what do you mean? Which piece should I play? So different, you know, those are different skill sets. Um, Western, like improvising musicians are often taught from, um, are taught, tend to be taught theory and repertoire, okay? so. You have to learn the language of jazz to be a jazz musician, much as you have to learn the language, you know, in Indian classical. There's a lot of emphasis on listening and a lot of emphasis on imitating. But I think one, one difference might be if you're in the Guru Shisha Parampara, a lot of gurus are not going to encourage you to listen to other gurus. But if you're studying jazz, you're almost always going to be told, listen to Charlie Parker. Listen to Miles Davis, listen to Thelonious Monk, listen to John Coltrane, and absorb as much of each one of these masters as possible. You're probably not, you know, I mean, I don't know what's exactly what's happening today, but you might not hear, listen to somebody from this Garana, but then listen to how the person from this Garana does it, and see what, what feels right to you. They're probably not going to say that, although some will, but many will say, imitate me the way I imitated my guru and learn this. And I'm sure there are people who will try to do that exactly, and others, depending on their personality, will say, okay, I'm gonna really sit at the feet of my guru and take that in, and then I'm gonna listen over there, and listen over there, and, and see what, you know, what really appeals to my personality or my, my aesthetics. That, that's, what, that's, what I, that's what I see. I'm just other questions? One question. Uh, you know, it's discussing the concept. Why don't you take the mic so that everybody can do it? Just to understand from the perspective of uh, uh, maybe your instrument, jazz, uh, saxophone itself, and maybe in the whole repertoire of jazz, that this concept of mead, which we have. Mead. Mead. And uh, also uh, the positions of the Shruti, of, which we have in the rag, like the Komal Ray of Bhairav and the Komal Ray of Puriya Thanish is very different. Yes. So how, is there something like this uh, also in the... Uh, well, there is, it's not specified in the same way, but, you know, when people are, we have what are called blue notes, and they may be considered a little bit like Ati, Ati Komal, you know, where will we play? Even that, that ga, right? That's, it's kind of a shud ga, but it's kind of not a shud ga. some extent. It's not, it's not the general aesthetic. I mean, we can do it. But, and there was one player back in the 50s, a guy named Johnny Hodges, he was playing alto saxophone, who was famous for long means. But there hasn't really been kind of a modern player who, who uses that a lot. The clarinet lends itself more to that because it has open holes. So your fingers can do a half hole and slide off. These keys are made, they're created to prevent that from happening. 
because in classical Western music, music that's considered an unattractive aesthetic. You know, the teachers will say, "Wait, man, you know, you're sliding into that note. What's wrong with you?" You know. <laughs> but but when I heard Indian music and sat with my teacher, and he would he would take 40 minutes to no, but he would take what seemed like an eternity to get from Como Re to Sa, and you know, you'd see like this whole world in that small shruti. I was like, whoa, that's that's amazing. And you know, I have to kind of fake it if I want, you know, and there's and there's certain places on the horn that are easier. If I'm, if I'm It's just, you know, 
So it's, it's an approximation. It's an approximation. Which is why I write my own music. <laughs> I mean, a little bit, because I'm, I'm dealing with two different aesthetics, and I kind of have to find a, a, some sort of middle ground. Hanji? Kuchna? Or Jesus? Yeah, you keep asking. <laughs> I'm just really curious. Uh, uh, I have read that you have been a faculty at multiple music institutions. But mi but minimally, teaching is teaching has not been uh, what I've focused on. But I've taught it like UC San. I mean, I've taught it different places. So. What is the one common thing between teaching and performing? What do you enjoy more? Which, well, those are two questions, right? What's the common thing, and which do I enjoy more? I like them both. I mean, I've done much, much more performing in my life. One thing that's special, I mean, that's really great about teaching is you learn by teaching because you try to distill the information. And um, I find, if, especially teaching good students, it, pu it pushes you, one, to clarify the information for yourself. And I remember some teacher somewhere telling me that what most people practice is stuff they already know. So, you know, we go over the same material over and over again, and uh, sometimes as we get what we imagine is advanced, we leave some of the rudiments behind, but it's really good to go back and, 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 visit, and visit them again. So, so that's a really good, good thing about teaching. It, it helps reinforce your foundation. Yes? What could be the effective uh, way of practicing and getting the precision uh, by applying SA or any scale to any note with a full focus and precision? How to practice that? Uh, uh, yes, the tambura is going in background. Say, E, e scale tambura. Yeah. So, how do I get precise note of that uh, level on my flute or any other instrument or by vocal? Any effective well, drum, drum, practicing with drones yeah. is very good, and I mean, and they're, they're, you know, I hate to say it, but, well, they're easily available on smartphones, so um, that that's one way. Is I, I tend to, I often, you know, I don't like, but I love pianos, and I've got two of them, so I often sit at home. When I was young, also, I mean, younger than I am now, I would, I would play. Well, I'd play one note for a really long time. I mean, until kind of the, I couldn't stand it anymore, and I would try to see how much I could hear in that one note. Um, much like a tambora, when you pluck a string, you can hear the overtones. You can hear that in a saxophone. If I play the lowest note, when I listen to that, when I listen to it for so long and I focus, I hear
if you know what I mean. I mean, if you're, you know, if you have a keyboard in front of you and you're singing, are you a singer? Yes. Do you want to come up here for a second? What, what sewer do you like to sing from, usually? some jazz kind of thing. I don't know what it is, but it totally like it totally transformed that song. And do you think it was had to do with chords or do you think it had to do with rhythm? I think uh, both of them, like chords and uh, rhythm also. Mm -hmm. Well, are you singing any classical music right now? I can do that. Like, like what? Uh, okay, and from what, what key do you what's what what's your sewer? Kali Kali Panj?
course, I could have been like that, and I just like, why would you change it? <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful, and you sang it beautifully. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really lovely. I mean, it's the wrong, we should, we should be having our morning chai and listening to that, but, um, yeah, I mean, for me, if I hear something like that, which is, like, I don't hear Harith as jazzy, per se, but I'd want some kind of, like, pulse, maybe on an acoustic bass. power. So if you make too many like chord changes, it it, it it can it really runs the risk of losing losing its beauty. Mm -hmm. And uh, but adding a slightly different feel to it can be can be I think really effective. Now, now that bandesh is a classical bandesh, right? Yeah. So maybe a Bollywood type piece would lend itself more to that. But I would be you know, even though I've done a lot of few, you know, quote fusion work, I'd be cautious about. I'd just be careful about not removing what, what makes raga so powerful. That's that's, that's just me, you know. And never use a drum machine. <laughs> Make friends with drummers, you know. I mean, drum machines to me are like, but. But again, I'm old-fashioned. But thank you. I'm glad you came up and did that. But subtle, subtly changing the bass note also can, can, can definitely work. Like when I, when I switch to this, you know, I think it can, it can still do. You just have to be careful what notes are being sung. And as you become more experienced as singers or instrumentalists, that works too. You just have to you have to figure out what mood you want to create and whether any change you're making is helping to augment that mood or taking away from from what you're doing. Good question though. Very good. Thank you. We have the microphone for the student so I'm not into those uh, technical terms uh, my question to you is uh, if I'm into my Indian vocals as well as uh, I want to learn any uh, instrument especially concerned with the mouth so will it affect my vocals in any way that's hard to say there are some vocalists who play you know one of our very famous godfathers of jazz, Louis Armstrong, was a great trumpet player and a great singer. So, um, and there, there are quite a few people who play saxophone and sing. I'm not one of them, but um, but I don't think it should affect your voice. I think to some extent it affected mine uh, playing. I think Mike Guruji, when I was, although I studied vocals with him, I think he felt that playing the saxophone kind of put some stress on my vocal cords that um, maybe made it a little harder for them to be as soft and supple as they should be. But I wouldn't say that because that would, and he preferred I focus on the saxophone. Um, but I wouldn't say because that was an issue for me that it will be for you. Plenty of, plenty of people, I think playing the flute is particularly gentle on the vocal cords. Playing the saxophone, um, you know, trumpet maybe. But I don't know, which, are you, what wind instrument are you thinking of playing? Not in something in 
particular, but especially the saxophone, I feel it's a very, you know, uh, it needs a lot of strength. So that is why. It, it does, but it is the best instrument. <laughs> no, but it's a great instrument, and it has it has a lot of vocal qualities. It's a very emotional. I think a, you know it's good at getting emotion across. <laughs> I mean, at the time, when I was actually studying with him, I was playing the soprano, the little instrument, which gives a lot more back pressure. This is pretty comfortable for me to play. I can play this for hours without any, um, you know, I don't, I don't feel winded ever from playing it. Unless I'm playing with a very loud band and I'm playing, blowing too hard because I can't, because I can't hear the sub, you know, subtleties. But, um, you know, People, sometimes people, especially in India, will say to me, well, do you do, do, you do some pranayama, you know, that must, you must need that. I said, this is pranayama. You know, if I'm, if I'm playing an instrument for two, three, four hours a day, I'm getting a great deal of lung exercise. So for me, it feels like a very healthy thing to do. So I would start playing, and if it doesn't affect your vocals, yeah, keep going. I mean, it probably won't, but if you see a problem, you can always stop. <laughs> One of you know, or 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 live with whatever changes maybe happen in your voice. Thank you, sir. I have, a, I have another question. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it's a general question actually. Uh, for an aspiring musician or an aspiring singer, uh, like in India or in abroad, we have lots of musicians and lots of good singers and good musicians. So what is that uh, one thing that differentiates a good musician and from an ordinary musician? Is it like only practice and passion, or is it like the uh, you know you have to know the technical things? Of it? I think I think there are a number of. I mean, it's it's really hard to say because good can be subjective. I mean, some people will like listening to an opera singer. Some people will feel that that's torture. So, I mean, you can't you can't necessarily. And some people, you know, I love listening to. Long, slow alops. It might drive somebody absolutely crazy who want want to hear, you know, Nirvana or some rock band. So, so good is a little bit hard to describe. But I think there are a lot of things that go into it. I think some people have natural gifts. Voices are often like that. Some people are just born with like beautiful voices. Um, born with a an ability to hear and retain oral information. I mean, I may play something to all of you, and only maybe three of you might be able to play it back to me right away or sing it back to me, because some of us just have this innate ability to, to hear information and organize it in our brain and kind of sort it out and go back. Some people are born with what's called perfect pitch. I, you know, there's some people I can say, okay, sing a G, and they'll they'll just sing it, and they they see pitches as colors. They have what is called a, uh, what, what's what's that word? Synesthesia. Synesthesia. So, you know, some people have perfect pitch. Some people are born with lustrous voices. Some people have incredible imaginations. Some people have. Um, you know, ability to focus and practice. Some people have great creativity. I mean, there are a lot of things that go into making making a great artist. I think um, having a sense of self confidence is 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 uh, is very important. You know, there are some great musicians who don't get on stage because they don't like it. Some some there are some brilliant musicians who feel like this is the worst place to be. You know, or they may have started there, and, and it becomes too stressful for them. So there are a lot of lot of factors that that go into play. But I think having some sort of natural aptitude, and then having the, you know, if you're fortunate to get a good teacher, that's really helpful. Or if you're fortunate to have a great deal of self direction and self motivation, these days there are instructional videos online, and you can get a lot further on your own than you ever could. But perseverance and hard work, as, as in everything else, are, are, are huge factors. You have to practice. 
you have to have a vision. You know, working on your dream is important. If you say that's, a, you know, I want to be that person there. That's a good way place to start and, and sort of model yourself after some artists that you really um, idolize or really appreciate. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, keep going. Okay, uh, like if I have a dream that I want to be a musician or a good singer. And I become a good musician and a good singer, and I'm performing everywhere, and I have lot of lots of money and fame, and what we call it. So, what after that? Like, uh, how to be consistent throughout your life? Like, if I'm choosing music as my profession, how to be consistent? Consistently, how to be like uh, keep doing good all my life? Like, if I'm a musician, how do I keep uh, playing good music like throughout my life? Well, I think, I think the main thing is to stay true to yourself and your belief and don't chase fame and popularity. I mean, that can be hard. If you've received <coughs> accolades, I mean, you're receiving um, praise, some artists continue to go after that praise. So they get very stimulated, obviously, by being on stage and people are doing something. And maybe they have an aesthetic objective and they go in a slightly different different direction and they start maybe their audience starts to fall away it's you have to be very strong you have to be very emotionally strong you also have to believe that you're doing it for the music you're not doing it for the fame you're not doing it for the money you're not doing it for outward recognition you're doing it i mean really i don't want to sound trite but you're doing it for your relationship with whatever the great mystery is. I mean, you're trying to get deeper knowledge about yourself, deeper knowledge about kind of the oneness that, that unites all of us. You know, you're trying to unlock some of the mysteries of the universe, and that's, that's a big job. So if you get a little bit of money, you get a little bit of fame, that's nice, but that, if you're focusing on that, you might run into trouble. Because we see a lot of famous people who, who, who suffer greatly, so. And, you know, that may be another thing as well. Artists do tend to have maybe greater sensitivities to a lot of things than other people do. But, um, yeah, if you stay focused on learning, because the most famous musician you know probably feels they still have an entire universe of knowledge to attain. Because those of us, you know, I've worked a long time and I work pretty hard, and, you know, I'm a baby, so, so I know I, I've got you know bucket loads to still learn, and that and that keeps me really happy knowing that, knowing that when I get off tour and get back home, oh great, I can practice again. I can continue writing some music that I've been working on. I mean, you have to cherish the work rather than the outward recognition. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good. Is that a good ending place? Does anybody else have any questions? Is that a good? Yeah. I'm doing my BPA Bachelor in Performing Arts Vocal right here in MIT. Mm -hmm. So this is a four years program, and I want to do my masters abroad. So now I'm doing it in Indian classical music. How would that matter or how would it differ if I do it outside or abroad in any country? Because that would be a change of music. Well, what, what, what do you want to study abroad? What, what aspect of music? So Western classical. Now if I'm doing here Indian classical, mm -hmm. uh, the same way you go with the fusion. So I want to, uh, my goal is to uh, uh, do a fusion between Indian classical and Western classical. Mm -hmm. So I want to work that out. So, uh, how, what are the electives that I should be choosing? And uh, what are the electives that you're choosing yeah, you, while, yeah, you, while sure, you're still because here? It's Indian classical music uh, that are uh, well, predominantly. What, what electives are available? I don't, I don't know. What are some of the possibilities? Uh, so actually, the syllabus is still uh, to be set in motion in the in the next year. So I just wanted to ask that uh, what would be the requirements to be eligible for master's program abroad? That's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I mean, when you say Western classical vocal, they, they may want to strip away, you know, what the technique that you have. I mean, I can imagine some conservative teachers saying, 
everything you've learned is wrong. Forget everything you know. And go, no! And you'll have to go, hmm, is that what I want to, you know. So, I mean, you might, might want to look for, I mean, is that what you want, though? I mean, do you want to become an opera singer? No, not, not really, not an opera singer. So what do you mean by West? Is there a type of Western classical music that you've heard that you would want to so pursue? I'm, I'm predominantly into pop, singing pop music. Okay. Well, so then you wouldn't. You might want to look at a school like the Berkeley School of Music, and the Berkeley School of Music now has, you know, uh, ARMON has some um, some scholarships available there, um, and there is an Indian ensemble there, so that might be a good place to start. Uh, the school that I went to, which is called the New England Conservatory of Music, has a program there that I think is still called the Third Stream Program, where it's a, it's perhaps a more creative approach where you don't have to do like straight ahead jazz and you don't have to do classical, but you can kind of just a course that you know where you as a uh, self-directed artist can kind of look for for some personal form of expression while developing your improvisational abilities, your ability to listen and, and develop on your own. That's it. Th those are the ones that I know about. There's another place also called the Cali CIA, California Institute of the Arts, Cal Arts as it's known, at, known as. They, they do have Indian music there, they have African music, they have um, jazz. It's a, very, it's a very good school. Um, so, Cal Arts. You may look at, I don't know exactly what goes on here, a place called Cornish Institute in Seattle. I think it's in Seattle. So there, there are programs and I think they're more, um, more open. I, I'd, be, I'd be worried about you showing up at a classical, Western classical vocal program where they'd say, honey, honey, what you learn, not gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, because they, because they can be really conservative. They didn't like it when I was at the conservative. They didn't like that I was trying to play Indian music. They didn't think that was okay at all. You know? so, so, do you suggest that I continue my masters in India itself? It, it depends. I mean, it depends. It depends what you're looking for. If you, you could continue your masters here. I mean, you know, it's it's great to have solid footing in your own tradition before you, uh, yeah. before you, before you wander off. I mean. And, and I would say, you know, if you do that, then spend some time looking at other musical forms and see if one of them really speaks to you. See if there's an artist that you would want to emulate. A Sheila Chandra, or a you know, some, somebody who, who maybe has been looking at some of this same territory and learned to play piano. Yes, sir. Oh, you're doing that already, yeah. So. Do, but I'm not that great. What? I'm not that great yet. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's really important for opening up the doors to Western right. music. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody? Anything at all? Nothing? Anyone? Well, we, we always end by going.
Well, when I come back, I, I expect everybody to be playing saxophone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.